And a pleasant good evening, everybody. Welcome to the College of Complexes. The time is now 8 o'clock, and let's get this uh, thing started again. My name is Tim, and uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from Bill Fong and uh, his non-alphabet part of China. Ron will be taking over for moderating after we uh, after he finishes collecting money from everybody. But. Uh, the college is very simple. It runs in the following format. We have a brief announcements period, and then from there we have our main speaker presentation, followed by a question and answer period. After that question and answer period, we have the infamous rebuttal period, where you guys will be uh, given a, a cer certain amount of time to speak your mind on any topic, whether it be related to the uh, speech or not. Without further ado, the alphabet and why Without one, China was held back from uh, the progress uh, that it should have made over uh, hundreds of years. Uh, China, the no alphabet hypothesis, uh, why China stagnated and lost the rate of modernity. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Bill Fong. Very happy to be here. Uh, before, like, before I begin, I would, uh, I would guess that there are non-Chinese people in here who speak Chinese. Uh, in such an august assemblage, there has to be somebody like that here. To you, I would say kudos, bravo, for taking the time and the effort to learn the language so alien and so different from the English language. And with that, we're going to start. No more ado. No more All right. As I said, I'm Bill Fong. I'm here to present. China and the No Alphabet Hypothesis. How China stagnated and lost the race to modernity. This is a basically a linguistic interpretation of history, Chinese history and Western history. This is a story also about Europe's rise to modernity with the alphabet, and not just the stagnation of China without one. So, to get started, we also talk about the modern resurgence of China. Now, lack of an alphabet was a formidable obstacle to modernity, and it held China back for close to 900 years. But China, as you know, is now an economic juggernaut. It is uh, growing so fast and so spectacularly that in some ways it's really kind of alarming. And we have to understand that process, how China got around the no alphabet barrier. Okay, and that would have insights for international trade, diplomacy, and of course, geopower, power, and politics. So, China and the no alphabet hypothesis, hypothesis in a nutshell. Well, basically it comes down to this. No alphabet means mathematics. I know some of you are going to say, wait a minute, China had mathematics. Yes, but a concrete mathematics, not an abstract theoretical mathematics. And we'll get into that. No mathematics means no science. No science means no technology. No technology means no progress. No progress, by definition, means stagnation. And China stagnated for 850 years at least. And so, during that standstill, the West catches up. China was at least a thousand years ahead of the West, but when you stand still for close to 900 years, the people behind will catch up, will catch up to you, and then rush past you on the road to progress. So China stagnated and lost the road to modernity to Europe because China didn't have an alphabet. So, I didn't dream this up all by myself. I didn't wake up bolt upright in bed one day and say, aha, China and the no alphabet hypothesis. This is the thinking, the big picture thinking of three big picture thinkers. There are Marshall McLuhan, I'm sure a lot of you people in this room know that name. Robert Mc, uh, Marshall McLuhan had a main collaborator and disciple, and as far as I'm concerned, the inheritor of his legacy. This is a man named Robert Logan. Marshall McLuhan passed away at the very last day of 1980. Uh, Mr. Logan carried on his work with a brilliant work called The Alphabet Effect, where he explains the rise of Europe through the power, the generative power, the cultural generative power of the alphabet. And last but not least, some of you may know the name James Burke. Uh, back in about 1989, he produced that magnificent uh, documentary, 10 parts, called The Day the Universe Changed. And he also has a lot to, had a lot to say about the alphabet and explained how the Gutenberg Press created not just the Gutenberg Revolution, but created a paradigm shift that really put the Renaissance on steroids and brought in the modern world. And finally, there's a big assist from a documentary called Sea Power, a global journey. It's narrated by Leonard Nimoy, 
This is the documentary that explains China's resurgence. This is the documentary that explains the engine that enabled China to get through the no alphabet barrier and become the emerging superpower that it is today. So, to these thinkers, I bring my perspective as a Chinese American. I'm bilingual, I'm bicultural. I would say, I grew up not speaking English till I was six years old. Uh, after World War II, my father went to China to fetch a bride, so coming home, the only language spoken in the house was Chinese for the first six years of my life. I didn't learn English till I enrolled in the first grade at age six. And I remember coming home my first day from school. And I said, hey, wow, that was cool, oh, that was fun. And my parents said, you're not done. I'm not done, what do you mean? You're going to Chinese school now. I am? Yeah. So I ended up uh, going to the local church in Chinatown, and for two hours a day, five days a week, grades one through six, for six years, I studied Chinese reading and writing. So I grew up bilingual, and of course I'm bicultural. I grew up studying, I grew up through my studies in Chinese school, I learned about my heritage, and I was struck by two things. But I was part of, being a Chinese American, I was part of two great traditions. One, I was an American, and that was a proud thing to be. We were ascended, we were number one. We were rising out basically unscathed from the ashes of World War II. We were on top, we were the superpower. It was a really proud thing to be an American, even at age five. But at age five, I also realized I'm Chinese, and I'm part of another tradition. Old, also proud, very ancient, going back about 5,000 years. And yet China today was, at that time, communist, um, backward, poor, uh, a basket case among nations, and had been for about a hundred years. And this was disturbing to me. I'm proud to be an American, but I'm really kind of embarrassed to be Chinese. How do I figure out this cognitive dissonance? And the day came uh, in uh, boyhood, I said, I'm going to figure that out one of these days. And it happened. And now I present to you China the No Alphabet Hypothesis. So, the basic premise of this is, the no alphabet hypothesis is that language forms the framework of consciousness. In spoken language, spoken language formats the mind in terms of how we hear things, how we hear other people speak, and then in turn how we speak. Spoken language formats, its most dramatic effect is, uh, in my personal experience, my Boston accent. I know I don't speak with one right now, but when I get tired or I've had too much to drink, my three years in Boston pop out, and I start speaking in a Boston accent. Because three years of hearing Bostonians speak reformatted my speech pattern. All right? And so when I get uh, tired or I'm not uh, uh, conscious of what I'm saying or being very careful how I speak, I have very great difficulty saying Dearborn Park without effort. It comes out Dearborn Park. Right? <laughs> and I park my car in the yard. And, uh, and stuff like that. And that's a middle class Boston accent. I figured out there was also a, a, an upper class Boston accent where you would say, I packed my cat and have it yad. Or I say, middle class, I packed my cat and have it yad. But the lower classes would say, I packed my cat and have it yad. I said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do the rich folks and the poor folks in Boston speak the same dialect and accent, but the middle class speak something so slightly different? My only explanation for, what, for that was that the poor folks served as servants to the rich folks and they had to speak the same dialect. Well, that's my personal opinion. All right. But then written language also forms the framework of mind. How we read and write. That is a process that is really very much detectable. And that forms the process for the framework, not for speaking, but for thinking that the written language formats your mind, creates the matrix, the logical matrix of how you think, how, how, your, how your thinking processes are formed, how they are bounded. Basically, as I said, written language frames and shapes your thinking processes. Now, it would come to, then it would come to be reasonable to think that non-alphabetic Chinese would format the mind one way, and alphabetic reading and writing would format the mind yet another. There would be two different thinking processes formed by two different ways of reading and writing. And that basically is the essence of China and the no alphabet hypothesis. Now, 
Now, what's the practical result of this? Well, if you analyze how your written language formats uh, a, 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 a culture's mind, the people within that culture, it really gives you a window into how that person thinks within that particular culture. In essence, China no alphabet hypothesis, if you really dive into it, will give you into a window into the Chinese mind, how it thinks. And if you look at the other side of it, what I call the pro-alphabet hypothesis, the affirmative version of theory, the other side, it would also give a person into a, a window into the mind of the Western thinking, how folks in this room think, all right? How you guys think mentally, how you process information. Obviously, this has insights for diplomacy, international trade, the intelligence community, uh, sadly to say, the military. So this then is basically, literally, a linguistic interpretation of Chinese and Western history. So, as I said, I went through the fast nutshell of China the Null alphabet hypothesis. Now we have to expand each one of those six or seven steps, arriving at the conclusion of China stagnating without an alphabet. So, no alphabet means no mathematics. This is the crucial piece of theory, because unless I can show, argue, demonstrate, uh, convincingly how the alphabet gives rise to mathematics, uh, I don't have anything really to talk about. So basically, what I'm saying is, China did have mathematics, even though China didn't have an alphabet. But it was a concrete mathematics. It wasn't notational. It wasn't something you did on, with paper and pencil, or ink and paper. Uh, they had physical objects organized in the system. It's kind of like a crude, non-electronic calculator. One of the systems they had was what they called the counting rod system. I, I haven't brought an illustration with me, but you, you'll get the idea. The Chinese, the ancient Chinese, could do algebra. Triple simultaneous equations, which I could barely handle in high school. But they could do this. Get three equations and get up, and which required three answers to a, to a single problem that had three aspects to it. They used this for grain distribution. The problem was, or the challenge, was there was good grain, there was uh, mediocre grain, and there was bad grain in terms of nutritional value. And they had to distribute this around the Chinese empire in proper proportions to make sure that people were not malnourished. This required a triple simultaneous algebraic equation. They didn't have paper and pencil algebra. They had, some, they had counting rods, which they would lay on the ground in a checkerboard pattern. And the rods were black and they were red. And by their rules, which nobody understands anymore really, you would place the rods either perpendicular, horizontal, diagonal, red rods, black rods, in various combinations, and they would solve the equation. Okay, that's great. But how many of us, what, that kind of math isn't easy to learn. Thank you. Right? And it's not easy to manipulate mathematical concepts in your head with that sort of, sort of thing. Also, after a while, Chinese mathematicians didn't understand what they were doing. It became rote. It's kind of like giving calculators to school kids now, trying to teach them arithmetic. They're just punching the buttons, but they don't know the mathematical principles at work. This is exactly what happened with the Chinese counting rods. So, how is it that mathematics, notational, abstract, theoretical mathematics, is not possible without the alphabet? Well, I'll give a simple example with algebra. Um, the Arabs discovered algebra. They discovered this first by discovering and finding the so-called Arabic numbers. They're not Arabic. They're actually Indian, called the Gwalior numbers. They imported these from Indian mathematicians and started playing around with them and married them with the Arabic alphabet and together with Arabic script and Indian numbers they created algebra. How did that happen? Well, they came up with the Arabic equivalent of x equals 1, y equals 2, z equals 3. That's what we learned in algebra back in high school. Now, algebra could never have been invented in China. Why? Because without an alphabet, there is no x, there is no y, there is no z. Without these features in your native tongue, in your native writing system, there is no way you can come up with the concept of x equals 1 it would be next to impossible for you to come up with the concept of a mathematical variable. And the Greeks, Euclidean geometry, the stuff we struggled with in high school, right? 
angle ABC, uh, line segment CD, bisected at E. How can you come up with angle ABC if there is no A, there is no B, there is no C in your, in your non-alphabetic language? So there, that's the main starting point. No alphabet, no abstract, notational, theoretical mathematics, which is the foundation of science. Now the next step. No mathematics means no science. How many of you have ever heard the cliche, mathematics is the, is, the science, is the language of science? But there's something else more subtle to it than that, uh, something more profound. The alphabet is basically a logical creation. Think about it, how it works, how you figure out words. You are using logic. It is an algorithmic system. The principle of logic itself, the seed of logic, is basically embedded in the, log in the alphabet itself. And through a lifetime of using the alphabet, of reading and writing, your mind becomes habitually logical. Because you are imbued with logical thinking in your reading and writing, in your everyday literate existence. Okay? So with mathematics, and the rigor of mathematics, and look at Euclidean geometry, it's logic, rigorous logic. Okay? That gives you the further reinforcement of logical thinking. And from that, the scientific method comes forth and we create science. Science creates technology, and with technology, without technology, there's no progress. All right? Look at our modern world today. I'm speaking you through an amplifier. I have a laptop computer. There's a video camera recording my speech. There's a data projector on the back screen. We have electric lighting. A lot of us drive cars. We have public transportation, okay, driven by electric motors on the, on the transit system. With internal combustion engines. Progress, progress, progress. It's an endless stream of technological innovation, beginning with the Industrial Revolution. In China, China also had a proud technological record. Silk, gunpowder, tea, paper, printing, the whole para tech, uh, technical parade that, last, that was over, that lasted centuries. They were the first to make cast iron. They, they were able to cast bronzes with a precision that other Bronze Age civilizations hadn't even come close to mastering. They had improved plows. They invented compartmented ships that wouldn't sink at sea if their hulls were punctured. They invented the stern post rudder. All kinds of stuff like that. But it came to a dead end stop around 1100 AD. And that was when the last world changing Chinese invention was invented the ship's magnetic compass. The first mention of it, of its use in Chinese literature is 1115 AD. The first mention of it, written uh, record of its use in the West was 1180 AD. After that, nothing new came out of China. Gunpowder, silk, tea, and all the rest. It's ancient history, quite literally. All the stuff we have now, the computers, the satellites, the iPhones, the iPads, telephone, radio, television, radar, jet planes, fax machines, data networks, the internet, what have you. Not a speck of it is Chinese in origin. Nothing new has come out of China in terms of technological advance since 11, about 1115 AD. That's close to 900 years. Of course, the situation has changed, but we'll get to that, how China uh, had a resurgence into modernity. Next. So China stagnates for 850 50 years. The West catches up. And rushes past China to be, the, to be the first to achieve modernity, to invent modernity on history's first go around. It wasn't China. China should have, it, sh it should have been China. Because China was so far ahead of everybody else. But China's working paradigm was trial and error. China did not have a theoretical or intellectual background of abstract theory, which couldn't give rise to science. And that paradigm, well, good enough to make it the ascended culture of the ancient world, wasn't good enough to make it make the leap from the ancient to the modern. Without an alphabet, China's writing system and its, and its intellectual advancement came to a dead stop for close to nine centuries. So, let's tell the story then, then right from the beginning. And let's get into the nature of language, the invention of writing, the invention of alphabet. 
How did this all come about? What was the, what was the very beginning? Well, we'll begin with pre-man. Now, what I have not listed here is all the various the evolutionary steps of man, the various hominids we found, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus, I can't even pronounce it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Australopithecus, I still can't pronounce it. Dr. Leakey and his whole crowd, all right? Well, what was happening with those uh, hominids that were standing upright and running about the, the, uh, the African plain? Well, pre man first had to make a decision. The forests in Africa were starting to recede. They were starting to form the open savannas, and pre-man had a decision. Does he stay, or does he retreat into the forest with the foliage as it goes back? He decides to stay. Now what does he have to do? He's got to cope with the hot sun. He's got to cope with the heat, so the first thing he does, or we do, if you think inclusively, uh, he loses his fur, because it's too hot to have fur in the open savanna. Then he has to deal with the sun's rays beating down. He's got to reduce his exposure to the sun. Then he makes his first anatomical mistake. He stands upright. <laughs> and from there, we can blame all our back problems from that monumental decision. All right. Then something else happens. Man grows dexterous. He's starting to develop hands. He's starting to do more and more clever things with his hands. But the use of his hands makes him smarter. Okay? And he grows steadily smarter as he uses his hands more and more. Then he suddenly, some, then suddenly, two thumbs up. Man has thumbs. Okay? And with this, these hands become incredible instruments. Eventually, in our time, you can do brain surgery with hands, you can cut diamonds, make jewelry, paint, play the violin, the piano. These hands are marvelous instruments. But with the perfection of these hands, the brain gets smarter and smarter, and it gets bigger and bigger. And then there comes the next anatomical consequence of a human evolution. The brain gets smarter, but it gets bigger, which means the head gets bigger, which means it's very painful for childbirth. It hurts, okay, to give, to give, child, to, uh, give birth to a child. Now, what happens next also is the brain is so complicated, it can't, it can't, come out of the womb full born. Much of brain development in, in modern humans takes place outside of the womb. A baby can't talk until about 18 months to two years because its neural circuits for language haven't formed yet. The baby brain is still growing for one to four years out after birth. So that means prolonged infancy. When you think about a four-legged animal like a, like a horse or a deer or a cow, when that baby drops, it's standing up within hours, sometimes minutes, and ready to run away from predators if necessary. The baby doesn't start to take first steps until the first end of the first year. Prolonged infancy. But a bigger and better brain starts giving rise to reasoning and abstract thinking. And this continues on and on and on until suddenly we have language. Suddenly, man is talking, and then all this culminates, consummates, and we come on the scene. Homo sapiens. Now, I just talked about what we call the hand-brain riff theory of evolution. I didn't make this up. Again, this didn't come to me in the shower. There's one book on it. There's the title, The Hand, How It Shapes the Brain, Language, and Human Culture. Everything I've been talking about. So, enter Homo sapiens, mankind, us. And we go through various stages. First stage, we're nomads, we're hunter-gatherers. Fruits, nuts, berries, roots, and of course we eat meat, we're hunters. Next step after that was the invention of agriculture. We plant stuff, but that means nomadism comes to an end. Agriculture means you gotta stay put until the crops are ready to harvest. That means permanent settlements. That means hamlets and villages. And then, Hamlets and villages become towns and cities, and that gives rise to civilization. With civilization, something else happened. Invention of writing, and then the invention of the alphabet, and on with the march of history to our present day. So, when was the first civilization? Most of us know the answer. The Fertile Crescent. The intersection, the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates River. The cradle of civilization. 
the Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq. How many of us have not heard that or any of those phrases? Though that first civilization was started by a group of people we call the Sumerians. And the Sumerians invent the first writing. Being the first civilization, they invented the first writing system. And believe it or not, <laughs> writing sprang forth from mathematics. Now I'm talking about how mathematics springs forth from the alphabet, but before the alphabet, writing sprang forth from simple mathematics. The mathematics of counting and keeping count. And the Sumerians did it with something called tokens. Now, I've used my drawing pad to draw some very crude <laughs> uh, symbols here. The next five minutes or ten minutes will be pure Robert Logan in his book, The Alphabet Effect, how he explains how the Sumerians developed writing. It started when they started to have to keep count of goods. What else? Agricultural goods. The first one is my, uh, a symbol for a cow. Second one is my symbol for sheep. Right? Third one is my symbol for a sheaf of wheat or barley, grain. Second one is uh, a jar shape, I will say, let's say it's wine. Beer. <laughs> And we'll get into that, whether the, the, the Sumerians first made beer or whether they first made bread. That's another discussion. We'll do that afterwards. Uh, the next jar, let's say that means oil. Okay? Now the Sumerians now had to keep count of this stuff. And I guess they were getting, they were getting into contracts and they were writing up oil, IOUs, all right? So they made physical clay tokens using symbols like this. So let's say they come up with a contract or a debt, or IOU. I owe you one cow, two sheep, three bushels of wheat, two jars of wine, one jar of oil. All right, they have these tokens and they put it in a jar. Then they seal it whatever time it comes to settle accounts. Well, what was in the jar? <laughs> no, when it came time to settle accounts, they break the jar. And then they count out the tokens and okay, so everybody settles up. But when they seal the jar, then you don't remember what the heck was in the jar, right? It's blank, all right? They figure out the, the, the answer to that problem. Write down what's on the jar. Take a stylus, a stick, and uh, scratch the whatever tokens are inside in the jar, all right? But then if we do that, we can just tell what's looking at it, tell what's inside just by looking at it. Well, what do we need these tokens for? You don't need those. We just know what's on the jar. Just yeah. inscribe the tokens on the jar, right? So that would work. Streamlines the process. But then the next step is, why a jar? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's an unwieldy, inconvenient shape, right? So why not flatten the sucker? Clay tablets. Clay tablets. This sets the stage for writing, okay? At least the physical medium. Clay tablets and a stylus. <laughs> And with this, the, the Sumerians invent cuneiform. All right. All right, just what I said. So, what begins as counting is what I call quantitative description. All right, you have a token for a cow. One token, one cow. That's quantitative. But the token itself represents a cow. That's qualitative. It's not a sheep. It's not a jar of oil. It's not a jar of wine. It's a cow. That's qualitative. If I want to talk about a sheep, I'll use a, I'll use a token for a sheep. Well, those are all nouns, simple nouns, agricultural foodstuffs. Now, this is my pure opinion, okay? This came to me in the shower. But I figured someone was doing these nouns, these symbols for, these, for simple things, and he came up with an idea of a sign for a verb. Yeah. All right? Now we're starting to get somewhere. Then he came up with a sign, well, how about an adjective? How about a pronoun? How about nouns for non-agricultural food goods? Next thing you know, we got a vocabulary, and then we make the jump to writing. We move from quantitative description to qualitative description. And the first writing system called cuneiform is invented by the Sumerians. Sumerians. They also create something else called a syllabary. Syllabary is a catalog of all the spoken sounds in their language. It's not an alphabet, it's a proto-alphabet. It's a precursor to an alphabet. And they didn't use this for domestic consumption. They used character-based cuneiform. But the syllabary was used for foreign names, foreign places, foreign kings. It was for foreign use, describing foreign things. And there we see cuneiform. I took this from Wikipedia, so I guess it's okay to use. 
and that's a photograph of a cuneiform clay tablet. All right. Uh, this, I know I heard a great story about a, a Sumerian clay, clay tablet. I have to catch up to it someday. Uh, it was on a PBS documentary where the narrator was talking about Sumerian writing. He said, we have a clay tablet, which is a letter from a schoolboy to his mother. It said, mother, you do not love me. You have sent me to boarding school with only one suit of good clothes. All the other boys have two good suits, and they're making fun of me. I only have one suit. Mother, what am I to do? The narrator said, we do not have the mother's reply. <laughs> That would have been interesting. Next step. The idea of writing spreads throughout the Middle East. And of course, we come to the Egyptians. They invent hieroglyphics, and they also invent their syllabic. Same purpose. Denotation of foreign names, foreign kings, foreign, foreign places. Hieroglyphics. We've seen that before. So now we come to the invention of the, of the alphabet. The alphabet was invented by a subject people of the Egyptians called the Serites. The Serites mined copper for, the, for their Egyptian masters, all right, in north, northeast, northeast Egypt. I have this fanciful scenario, obviously not true, but I imagine the Serite elders are sitting around one day saying, you know, if we're going to get anywhere as a people, as a race, we have to learn how to read and write. Let's ask our Egyptian mas masters how to read and write. And from there, uh, they said, well, here's our hieroglyphics. And the Sinai said, oh, no, way too complicated. We can't deal with that. And the Egyptians said, well, here's our syllabary. Oh, yeah, that looks interesting. And from using the syllabary, the Sinai made the jump to the first true alphabet. Of course, that didn't happen. The scholars say this is probably what happened. The, the Egyptians needed Sinai foremen to supervise the mining crews for copper production. Well, supervisors had to deal with management. <laughs> Which means supervisors were going to get instructions, all right? Practices, procedures, and maybe production quotas. And man, supervisors have to write production reports, all right? So, certain so supervisors had to be, to some degree, literate. And of course, teaching them hieroglyphics was out of the question. You had to start with your education from childhood to learn hieroglyphics, just like you have to learn with, you know, for, for most of us, you have to learn from childhood to learn, learn Chinese. And besides, writing was probably the province of the priests and the nobility, and writing is power, and you want to give that to the Sirites? No way. All right. But there had to be literacy among the Sirite foremen, so they gave them the syllabary, trained them in the use of the syllabary. And using the syllabary, the Sirites thus made the jumps to the first alphabet. Well, the alphabet proves to be a real hit in the Middle East. Okay, soon everybody started having the alphabet. The Hittites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Hebrews, everybody started building an alphabet. And eventually the Phoenicians got the alphabet. All right, and all these people were Semitic, all right? They were all kind of related to each other, all coming from the Middle East, except the Egyptians. They were a bit different. So the Phoenicians complete their alphabet, and things move along, and who did it come across? The Greeks. And the Greeks now are starting to become civilized. They run into the Phoenicians, and uh, the Greeks say, Wait, hey, what do you guys got there? Well, it's called an alphabet. Yeah, cool. Can you teach that to us? Oh, sure. And so the Greek alphabet was directly derived from the Phoenician alphabet. Now the Greeks had the alphabet. Now they're starting to get rolling on civilization. There was a problem. There was something missing. There was confusion. Because... The previous alphabets invented by Semitic peoples had no vowels. They weren't necessary. The nature of the Semitic languages, spoken languages, were such, you look at uh, written writing, you can figure out what the word was from context. Okay? Uh, consider if I, I didn't do it, but suppose I flash the letters BG on the screen, and I'm not going to give you a vowel. How would you pronounce BG? Big or bang, right? No? Okay. But then that's, that doesn't, according to the rules of phonics, that wouldn't suggest itself with no vowel. The good, big, big. But we have bag, big, big, bog, bug, all five vowels. The, the Greeks faced that similar kind of problem, confusion and ambiguity. They say, well, what's missing here? Vowels. The Greeks invented vowels. They needed vowels, so they invented them. 
they didn't invent them whole cloth. They didn't just pull them out of thin air. What happened was, in translating the Phoenician alphabet to Greek consonants, they had a number of signs left over. They said, oh, let's take these leftover signs and make them vowels. And the Greeks perfected the alphabet. And as far as I'm concerned, with the perfection of the alphabet, with the Greek alphabet, that's when Western civilization began. All right? My opinion. With the alphabet, the Greeks invent... No vowels, sounds familiar. <laughs> with the alphabet, the Greeks invent geometry, as I said before. All right? Angle A, B, C, line segment C, D. They invent formal logic. They invent rules for argument. They invent the syllogism. And from that comes philosophy. And from philosophy, it's a short jump to science. And with these methods, these intellectual tools, the road to modernity begins for the Western world. So they get, the Greeks get conquered by the Romans. But then Rome falls in 476 AD. The Dark Ages begin, the early medieval period. That's from what, 800 to 1300 uh, AD, CE. Then the High Medieval, the things start easing up. The Dark Ages start receding. And the Renaissance begins around 1300, the early 14th century. Something interesting is happening to create something called the Renaissance. The lost legacy of the Greeks and the Romans during, lost during the Dark Ages is being rediscovered. It turns out that the Arabs had translated all of that stuff and had preserved it in Arab texts. These are being rediscovered and being retranslated into Latin. Most of it was coming from Islamic Spain. Turned into manuscript and sent to Europe where they were read by educated, literate people, and oh my God, this is, the, this is our legacy. It's being, being rediscovered. We're having a rebirth then of our, of our roots, of our culture. Thus, the Renaissance, which means rebirth. Then something happened that caused the end of the Renaissance. Okay? That was Gutenberg. What's so special about Gutenberg? Oh, he invented the printing press. Yeah, he invented the printing press and movable metallic type. What was important about that? Well, up until then, the spread of knowledge was uh, slowed down by the fact of how, by the, how you produce books. It was by hand copying. Slow, tedious, expensive. Books were scarce. They were chained down to their book stands and their libraries because people would steal them. Scholars were, by definition, wanderers. They had to go to where the books were. It's not like going to the college bookstore with your MasterCard and paying exorbitant prices for textbooks. You literally had to go to where the textbooks were in order to study. And you had to do it in Latin. Well, what was happening was Gutenberg's coming up with an idea for printing. All right? Now, in the old days, to create a page of a book, you had to copy the book. You had to copy the page however long that took. And there were people called copyists. They literally made their living copying books. Gutenberg said, well, if we take movable metallic type, set the page with movable metallic type, lock it in a frame, put it on a press, ink the frame, put a piece of paper on it, press the paper against the type with the frame, voila, a page. But then we can make another copy, and another copy, and another copy, and another copy, as many as we need. Then we set up the frame for the next page and print it, another copy, another copy. Then we knock it down, third page, fourth page, and we keep this process up until we complete the Gutenberg Bible, the first book that Johannes Gutenberg printed. What did this mean? It meant a cultural big bang for Europe. It meant the Renaissance would be put on steroids and would morph into the modern period. Books became affordable. It wasn't so, that, so expensive anymore. Books became available. You can make as many as you want. And just as important, books became readable. Because now, books didn't have to be printed in Latin. You can print books in the vernacular. The vernacular uh, languages that the people actually spoke. And the result was, books flooded Europe. The ideas in those books flooded European minds. And bang, the Renaissance was on steroids. Gutenberg's introduction of the Gutenberg Press in 1454, that's the best date we could put on it. It's actually that decade sometime around. And they basically it was a process, not, a, not an event. But it basically began the countdown to the end of the Renaissance. 
because knowledge was spreading around. Now, those, those texts that were being translated from the Arab into uh, Latin suddenly were being printed in greater and greater quantities. And then suddenly, eventually, it became printed in popular languages, all right? The European mind became flooded with information, and it never looked back, all right? The Renaissance suddenly picked up speed in terms of information flow and was moving so fast that the Renaissance had less than 50 years to go. And the Renaissance suddenly morphed into the modern period, our time. And the modern, modern era period, modern age, had several eras within it. Uh, my, some of these might be out of order, but we had the age of discovery. Modern period began around 1490 or 1500, depending on who's counting. That's the age of discovery. Columbus, Magellan, and all those guys. The age of enlightenment, the age of reason, the industrial revolution, our computer revolution. We now, uh, our computer revolution has gotten to the point where we call it the information age. And then somebody came up with something called postmodernism, but I have yet to figure out what that really means. <laughs> so the West advances and creates the modern world. The West invents modernity and comes to rule and dominate the modern world for the last 500 years. Of course, we all know that paradigm, that pendulum is swinging back to the East now, just starting. And it becomes a question. This Western era was not the only alphabetic culture. All right, Sanskrit is alph al alphabetic. Uh, Arabic is alphabetic. Turkish is alphabetic. If all these other alphabetic languages, but they were not the cultures that invented modernity. Well, there had to be a certain amount of luck. And for the West, that stroke of luck was Gutenberg, which created the intellectual revolution that ended the Renaissance and created the modern times. So the question is, which, which culture, which alphabetic culture becomes the one that achieves modernity first? It's Western Europe. And who inherited that legacy? Who's the top dog of the Western world now? Which one is the ascended culture of our modern times? Hey, what do you know? It's us, the United States of America. How long we're gonna stay there? I don't know. And we're all worried as hell about it. So basically, we gotta look at the nature of the alphabet. We've just seen how the alphabet has come from the invention of writing, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, all the way to the Gutenberg, the Renaissance, all the way to our modern times. How did that happen? What were the qualities of the alphabet that made this possible? What are its features? What are the advantages of it? What is its power and what is its legacy? Well, some of its legacy we've already covered. Well, for one, the approach of the alphabet. It codes for spoken language. The sounds we make when we speak. It does not code for direct representation of meaning, which Chinese writing does. When we say dog, we would spell D-O-G. But when you say dog in Chinese, we have a character for dog, which can, you can remember only with rote learning. Rote? I, I must say the Chinese school was a real drag and real tedious because there was no alphabet, no organizing phonetic principle. I had to learn everything by rote memory. That's for one. Two, it's simple. In the English alphabet, 26 letters. German alphabet, about 30. Right, when Gutenberg printed, invented his printing system. Who was a German. And it's all bound together with just one simple phonetic principle. Make each letter sound for, uh, stand for a sound value, not for a specific idea or concept. Therefore, it's easy to learn. But then, since it's simple, it's also scalable, which means you can mechanize the alphabet which is basically what Gutenberg done. He mechanized the physical act of handwriting, of hand copying, which produced, which created mass production of books. As I've already covered, is logic based. Logic is incorporated into the alphabet itself. The alphabet itself can serve as a seed container for logic itself. And from that can spring formal logic and scientific thinking. And then the mind, through the use of the alphabet, becomes habitually logical in its approach to all things. It's generative. In English, 26 letters generates all two million words of the English alphabet. 26 letters and one phonetic principle. That's all it takes. It's astonishing. 
when you really start to think about it. What happened? It's open-ended. Not only is it generative, it keeps on being generative. It doesn't generate two million words and stops. It creates new words as, as they are needed, as they are needed. Look at the word laser. Uh, the word laser has been around for 30, 40, 50 years, but it was a new word. It's a word that came out of an abbreviation. What is that? Light amplified by stimulated emission. Of radiation. You're right, of radiation. Of radiation. Yeah. It's a new word. Stop that. <clears throat> anyway, radar is a combination of two words, of, of two, three words. Uh, radio and ranging. <laughs> Radio detection and ranging. Radio detection and ranging. That's radar. We invent whole new words in the English language, for that matter, Western language, European languages, as they are needed, as science and technology rolls along. It's algorithmic. Again, that's a fancy way of saying phonics. There are logical rules in forming words in the proper order, in the given order. And of course, this reinforces the use of logic. It's linear, it's sequential. D-O-G moves from left to right. Convention moves from left to right. You have to parse, parse it in a linear sequential form. This means English alphabetic, alphabetic writing is left brain versus Chinese, which is pictorial, graphic, imaging. Chinese is right brain. And that has a lot of, that has implications along the line, down the line. Then there's something called fixed order. Alphabetical order. All right? We all know what alphabetical order is. Now, I'm going to tell a joke. How come there are no telephone books in China? Because with all those wings and wongs, you might wing a wrong number. <laughs> but the serious point is, if I wrote down the Chinese characters for the surnames wing and wong, and I didn't tell you which was which, how would you know which one was wing? How would you know which was wong? If I presented them one, two. Last but not least, you have no idea how to pronounce them, okay? But that's the joke. How do you organize a Chinese phone book? Until one day I asked a Chinese immigrant, well, how do you organize a Chinese phone book? And he says, well, basically, you create a phone book, uh, the, the surnames are organized by a number of character strokes in the name. So for all, uh, for all Chinese names that say, have, say, four strokes, those would be listed first. Then five strokes, then six strokes, then seven strokes, eight strokes. My Chinese surname, which is Fong, has four strokes. So to find Fong in the Chinese phone book, you have to look up all the surnames with four strokes. That's how it's done. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's, it gets worse than that. How do you organize a dictionary? It's brutal. Okay, um, I, uh, my middle character, the middle character in my Chinese name, unfortunately I didn't write it down, but it has 20 strokes in it. Okay, and I walked down to the Chinatown branch of the library, talked to this middle-aged immigrant Chinese woman who was a librarian. Obviously she's literate in both English and Chinese. And I showed her this character. And I said, I have a paper and ink Chinese English dictionary. I want to look up this character. I know what it means. I know how to look it up on the internet, but I don't want to do that. I want to look it up with the old-fashioned ink and paper way. Can you look this word up for me? Because I've tried, and I can't locate it in this paper dictionary. So she starts looking, looking for it for me. Now here's a woman, literate in Chinese, educated in it, for her first language. It took her 20 minutes to find that character. How do you organize knowledge with a written language like that? How do you organize a dictionary? How do you organize an encyclopedia? How do you organize a library catalog? How do you organize knowledge? And the Linnaean classification system of all animals, plants and animals, that would never have been possible with the Chinese language. Because you just can't come up with alphabetical order. Okay, phonics time. This is the next to the last word in the English dictionary. How do you pronounce that, class? Zimmergy. You figured it out in about two seconds, right? You know how to pronounce it. Now, class, 
What does it mean? Uh, uh, nobody knows what it means. Right. You know how to pronounce it, but you don't, un you don't know what it means. That, to me, is still awesome. That's incredible. There's no way you can do that in Chinese. What does Zimiji mean? It's uh, fermenting. It means the art of fermentation. We're making things like wine, beer, cheese, tofu, and stuff like that. <laughs> it comes from the Greek word zemikos, fermentation. Duh. So the point is, you didn't know what it meant, but you knew how to pronounce it in two exactly. seconds flat. Exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's funny. Right. What does this mean? Okay. No. 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 All right. The first one is pronounced oh, 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 it's language. It's language. This is this, this is written Chinese. The first one is pronounced Jungko in Cantonese. Okay. It means China. That's the second character in the, in the the one in the middle. No, the one on the left is language. No, we're going we're going up and down. Oh, up and down. So it's the one below language. <laughs> right. That's Chinese. This is Chinese. This means it's been translated as the Middle Kingdom. Yeah. Right. I've never been happy with that oh, as a kid. Middle Kingdom. Middle kingdom. No, no. To me, Chinese. the first character means central, middle. Right, middle kingdom. Second character means country, nation, oh. kingdom. To me, it became more. It just sounded better for me to say the central country, because in the Chinese scheme of things, they thought they were the center of the universe. Right. All right. Still do. Yes. Uh. <laughs> uh, the second character is pronounced Mei Gao. We know this means country. Mei means beautiful. <laughs> this stands for America. Oh. The United States. In Chinese, the United States is called the beautiful country. Oh. Now this is pronounced Ji Ka Guo. Ji Ka Guo is Chinese for Chicago. Oh, <laughs> the first character is... The one on top. One on top. Ji Ka Guo. Now these characters have literal meanings, but they've been, they've been stripped of their semantic content. We're just going for their phonetic value. G in this case, if you look it up on the internet dictionary, it says uh, it's a species of zoysia, the grass which grows in southeastern China. Well, we don't have zoysia here. We have we live in the land of the prairie state. We have different grasses. We don't have zoysia, all right? Uh, so it's irrelevant to us Chinese living here in Chicago. Uh, so G, this character in Chinatown, now means cheese. <laughs> Believe it or not. I thought this was bogus. So when someone told this to me, no, you got to be pulling my leg. So I go to my favorite Chinese bakery. <laughs> they have cheesecake labeled in English and Chinese. And sure enough, that's oh, cheese. No. <laughs> that's cheesecake. Ga. Ji ga. Guo. Ji ga. Ga means to add, to mark up. To add stuff or to mark up in price. Right? Ho ga means very much marked up, expensive. Gam ga means reduced markup. Discount sale, right? So and this means older brother, go off, big brother, right? <laughs> now, if you read this, read this literally, it would come out cheese add big brother, which is of course a nonsensical phrase, but it's stripped of its meaning only for the phonetic value and becomes Chicago, Chicago. Are you Chinese. sure they didn't get the actual essence of Chicago? Because it seems like you've gotten a lot of air. Essential characteristics already of politicians. <laughs> big brother marks up cheese. Right? Yes. Yeah, you've got commerce, you've got you've got big brother, and you've got you've got uh, prairie grass. Well, that's a metaphor that escaped yeah. me, but I'll yeah. take credit for it. <laughs> yeah. I got a guy who'll give you a bargain on some stinky onions. <laughs> Chicago. Right. How would you say one fool at a time in Chinese? Oh, I have to think about that. We don't have time. We'll do it later. After question period. I'll think about that. But that's, as I said, when you looked at it, you had no clue as the pronunciation or meaning. With Zimiji, you at least got the pronunciation. So now you're beginning to see the difference between alphabetic Chinese, uh, non alphabetic Chinese, and alphabetic uh, Western writing. Read that out loud. Another fine mind by the public educational system. Yeah. Oh, ruined. Yeah. Class, somebody say it officially. Another fine mind ruined by the public educational system. Right, a whole new way of spelling it, but following the rules of phonics, right? Yeah. Yeah. More fun with phonics. <laughs> so, let's get to the nature of the Chinese language. There is only one written Chinese language. There are many spoken dialects. 
Reading off the same page, a Mandarin speaker will read it one way, and it will be unintelligible to a Cantonese speaker. A Cantonese speaker would read it his way, according to his dialect, and be unintelligible to the Mandarin speaker. So, it, technically, there's no such thing as a Mandarin language. There's a Mandarin dialect. There's no such thing as a Cantonese language. There's a Cantonese dialect. Now, yes, that's true, but it's not quite that simple. Because there's something called regionalism. I'll illustrate this with a bad cowboy movie I once saw that was made in black and white, came from the 40s. And there's a gunfight in the saloon, and a cowboy jumps out of the, out of the saloon talking to people who saying, what happened, what happened? Oh, some guy got shot in there, he's deader in a mackerel. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> deader in a mackerel was a regionalism that would come from Maine, Boston, coastal New York, Rhode Island, right? Maryland, where they have mackerel. There's no mackerel in Texas or Arizona, right? <laughs> what, the, <laughs> what the script writer should have written on, you know, he's deader in a doornail. You know, that would communicate in Texas. Yeah. Or, he's buzzard bait. Something like that, all right? So, I was in a hospital, and uh, they had the services posted in different languages. Spanish, Polish, Chinese, Japanese. But in Chinese, it had it listed in Mandarin, and it had it listed in Cantonese. I said, wait a minute, it's the same written language. Ah, but the regionalisms. Okay, I had another situation uh, where I was a director of development, grant writer for Chinatown's biggest uh, public uh, social service agency and charity. And there was a, we had to translate a six-page document in English into Chinese, but our translator was book solid. I mean, he just couldn't do it in time. I said, well, I told the boss, well, why don't we just parcel it out to different people to translate different sections of it? She said, you can't do that. Why? Because we're all from different parts of China, and everyone would start translating according to his or her regionalisms and idioms. And somebody reading the finished product would know that this was translated by committee, not by one person. Uh. Ah, interesting. Little nuance there that even I didn't know until late in life. So, question, how come China didn't develop an alphabet? That's an intriguing question. The problem is, Chinese is monosyllabic. Every word is one syllable. One word, one syllable. Okay? So if you had an alphabet, then you have wind up all kinds of homonyms. You know, it's a parallel problem to uh, the Greeks and the Phoenicians. Okay? Uh, the word, the, the syllable G. G can mean paper, pig, point, live someplace, um, there are a few other word meanings of that syllable that escapes me, but there's about 10 or 12. And you start saying G, or you start alphabetizing G, well, what do you mean? Pig? Paper? Point? Live? What? What do you mean? What? And there are other examples of this. So this creates written confusion. This wars against the development of an alphabet. That's the nature, the spoken nature of the Chinese alphabet, which has consequences for the written language. So, now we come back to Chinese thinking versus alphabetic thinking. That's a little bit ahead of the story. Chinese thinking, as I said, is based on ideograms, non-alphabetic. It's a picture, not necessarily of a, a representative picture of a thing. In the beginning, it started that way. The character for sun looks like the sun, the character for moon looks like the moon, the character for mountain looks like the mountain, the character for tree looks like a tree. You start getting abstract concepts, so concepts like love, unbelievably different. You've seen the concepts, uh, characters for country, for beautiful, for big brother. Okay, it's so stylized, it's beyond pictorial representation. But it's still graphic, it's still visual. Chinese reading and writing is based on visual pattern recognition. You don't parse it. You look it, you see it, you either know it or you don't, you recognize it, and then by rote memory, you get the meaning. And there's no other way to do it, rote memory. It's not a logical thinking process. Once the, once the Chinese mind identifies the meaning, it just shuts down. It doesn't think any further, because it's not using logical principles. It's using pattern recognition and rote memory. I flowcharted this process, the mental process of Chinese reading and writing. Here it is. It fit it, it fit in a piece of paper 11 by 17. 
This is my flowchart analysis of what happens in the Chinese mind when it reads Chinese characters and writes it. All right? 11 by 17 piece of paper. They said, now I got to do a similar exercise for alphabetic reading and writing. So I put it on an 11 by 17 piece of paper. This is completely inadequate. The mental process of describing flowchart description of, Chinese, of alphabetic reading and writing cannot fit on a piece of paper this small. So I went about expanding the chart. This was the final result. <laughs> Uh, I use the word convention as an example and parsed out how you would figure out how to pronounce the word, say, if you were a child or someone learning the English language. All right? This is how big the chart is for alphabetic writing and reading. This is what is going on in your head when you read in an alphabetical form. These are logical processes going on in your mind. You as a Westerner are a very logical person just by sheer dint of your literary cultural heritage. This took me a month to work out. Uh. Now you see laid out the differences between Chinese and English and alphabetic languages. Next step. Okay, all right. Gutenberg invents the printing press. That starts the modernity process rolling. Well, hey, okay, China didn't invent modernity. Why didn't just China just immediately start playing catch up? Okay, the first step, well, before we get into that, we gotta talk about the nature of technology and how technology drives modernity. From there, we talk about Marshall McLuhan. This guy, I don't know, I worship the, the metaphysical ground this man walked on. <laughs> All right. He starts describing the stages of modernity and how each stage is characterized by a stage of technology. When we as humans start doing purposeful stuff, it begins manually. We do it with our hands. All right. We're hunter-gatherers. We're digging for roots. What do we use? Our hands. All right. Then we figure out simple tools. We use a rock, a stick, whatever, right? To expand the power of our hands. And then we figure out a shovel, all right? That continues until we figure out how to mechanize our machinery. The ultimate example of that would say power tools for digging, excavation tools, backholes, steam shovels, bulldozers, that sort of thing. We mechanize our technology. And each of our technologies amplifies our power to do things. We dig roots until our hands bleed, and we can't do it anymore. All right, so we pick up a stick and a rock, and we can or a clamshell, and we continue. And then, we'll, oh, we'll, we'll invent a shovel. We can dig more. All right. How am I doing for time? You're fine. Okay. Uh, so we have mechanization, and then mechanization shifts over to non-muscle power. All right? Mechanization. We have a plow. Draw it by an ox. All right? Or a horse. But then, suddenly, we have a track. Mechanization. Then we have electrification. Electric lights. Okay. Electric motors for our CTA trains. All right. We have electric technology. And then we have electronization. Then we start inventing things like radio and television. That's where instead of raw use of current like a light bulb would use, we start playing games with the current, make it do things, field effects with coils, resistors, transistors, vacuum tubes. We make the current do tricks and so create more sophisticated technologies. And then electronization becomes computerization. And, we, and what? And computerization does wonders for the alphabet. With the computer, we manage huge amounts of alphanumeric data. We come up with things like the IRS, automated billing systems, magazine subscriptions, Visa, MasterCard, what have you. Computerization moves on to the next step where we do digital imaging. Those are the stages of technology. The last two stages uh, I've added because Marshall McLuhan passed away 30 odd years ago, December 31st, 1980. His work needs to be updated, but his work basically is sound. So now we look at these stages of technology as it relates to the alphabet. First stage would be manual. How do we first write? I guess fingers in the sand or dip paint, 
dip our fingers in the ink and paint and draw on the cave walls. No. We use our hands, we use our bodies to start writing, doing art. Then we use simple tools. We invent pens, stylus, styli. Right? Then Gutenberg. He mechanized, he mechanized the physical and the handwriting because it was possible to do it with the alphabet. The problem is, as I said, why didn't China just import some Gutenberg presses and start a catch up with the modernity game? Simple. How do you inventype how do you inventory printing type for 50,000 Chinese characters? <laughs> now, the Chinese invented printing, which is simply easier to just carve each page of a book in wood. And carve the next page you would, carve the next page you would, okay? It was easier to do that, tedious as, old, as though it may sound, than the inventory type with different fonts and different sizes for 50,000 Chinese characters. So the, China, so the Gutenberg Press was a non-starter for China. Then comes electrification. The electrification of the alphabet came in the form of the telegraph. Morse code. I didn't put up a slide, but my name, Fong. If I were to send it down Morse code, down the telegraph line, or do it with radio telegraphy, I would go, that's Fong, down the telegraph line. But if I were to write my name, Fong, as a Chinese character, uh, Morse code that, send that down the, tel the telegraph line. No. You look at me like I was out of my mind. Of course it couldn't be done. That's how China got shut out of, another, of the next stage of modernization of its language. All right? Well, electrification moves to electronization. That didn't do much for the alphabet. It created other things, visual media, oral media. It created radio, it created television, motion pictures, that sort of thing. That sort of thing. <laughs> But the alphabets started coming to fore with the invention of the programmable computer, alphanumeric. And like I said, we have the government <laughs> who knows all, everything about you. We have marketers with data mining who, with computers who know, know more about you than you know yourself. And then finally, and that of course, China couldn't be, couldn't be, a, couldn't, couldn't jump on the computerization bandwagon. We're shut out of that stage of modernity. All right, why? Well, go back to the telegraph. No mode of transmission was called Morse code. Next step was the invention of teletype. The first teletype mode of transmission was a code called Bado. I guess it's French. The next mode was, hang on to your hat, ASCII. ASCII. ASCII was the, was the mode of transmission for teletype. And of course, it became the mode of transmission for the computer keyboard, the CPU, the internet. And things can, then China got shut out of that stage of modernization the Chinese language simply couldn't be adapted to it readily. And finally, imaging. Then things get interesting for China. With imaging, they created something called Unicode. All right? Everything. Which made it possible to program for non-alphabetic language. Chinese, ah, Japanese, every Korean, language. and everything else. Every so, that's how China got shut out of the modernity game. The results were disastrous. The West steadily advances, China grows steadily behind. No one notices the stagnation at first because China's so far ahead. But the West does catch up by the early 1800s. The China, the West then bolts past China in the 1800s with a bang, literally. We come upon the Opium Wars. What was that all about? Opium. Opium. The British, the British, the form of modernity. Modernity came in the form of the British Army in the 1840s. Now, the British public was crazy for Chinese good, especially porcelain. I mean, they were, Europe, not just Britain, was crazy about the stuff. Buying it up left and right, and the Chinese were saying, you'll pay for this stuff in silver, which was draining silver out of the British exchequer. This caused great alarm in Britain. So, we gotta find another way to pay for Chinese uh, porcelain. Matter of fact, for a while, porcelain was banned, according to one story I heard. Porcelain was banned in Britain for a while to stop the stanch to flow of silver out of the country. That didn't work. What the consequence of that was the rise of the Josiah Wedgwood Company, English China. There was also Mad, Mad King Ludwig of Bavaria, who loved porcelain, who had a, had his mad, had a mad desire to own every piece of porcelain in, in Europe. But he was running out of money to buy the stuff. So he told his alchemist, I want you to create gold so I can buy more porcelain. If you don't, I'll execute you. I'll cut your head off. 
a desperate alchemist tried to create porcelain and f tried to create gold and failed, but saved his skin. <laughs> he reinvented porcelain. And now we have mice in China and the German porcelain, stuff like that. So, Britain comes up with an idea. Instead of paying for, for porcelain with silver and other Chinese goods, we will pay for it with opium. We're growing the stuff in our colony, India, and we'll force the Chinese to take this in, pay, in payment. The Chinese were, hey, no, no way, you're trying to turn our nation to a country, our country into a nation of addicts? Well, so what? We, you're going to take opium. Chinese said no, the British said yes. Chinese burned the opium, like we threw the tea over the, <laughs> into Boston Harbor. The British got upset, sent in an army of 40,000, 48,000 men, and whooped the Chinese. Because the British army was martyr. In its organization, in its thinking, in its outlook, its weaponry. From the accounts I read, the Chinese were still fighting with matchlocks, not modern rifles. I mean, that is about as primitive as you can get. All right? That begins China's humility, century of humiliation. China gets Hong Kong. Then every, all the Western imperial powers start piling in. We want our piece of the China pie. Germany, France, even the United States. We were there during the 1920s with our gunboat diplomacy. Okay? The U.S. Navy had a presence there with our gunboats that went up and down the Chinese rivers. We want to get the questions so we can... Okay. I'm about ready to end so, China became a basket case among nations. I'm going to go real fast now on how China modernized. Okay? China had to have some, some things happen before it could modernize. Oh yeah, final insult. China gets invaded by an eastern country that was westernized called Japan. The Sino-Japanese War, which Japan won, that's how China lost control of the Korean Peninsula, and Taiwan became a Japanese colony. Didn't get that, you know, didn't come free the Japanese then in World War II. So modernization begins in 1978. That's when Deng Xiaoping came to power. Exactly what happened? Well, a constellation of factors had to happen. The stars had to align first for China for modernity to happen. There had to be political stability. That didn't happen with the declaration of the Chinese Republic in 1911. Sun Yat-sen, president of China, could not consolidate power. They fell into the anarchy of the warlord period. Then the Japanese invasion. Then finally, Mao arose. The communist revolution and a strong central government arose. One party rule. So, political stability, but China then went into an anti-Western tirade that lasted 30 years. The Cultural Revolution, xenophobia, anything Western was automatically bad. But they finally threw that out. The Gang of Four got pushed out of power. The reformers took control in 1978. 1979 restored Deng Xiaoping to power because they knew he was a modern, modernist visionary. And he guided China's entry into the modern world. Second, third, capitalism gets it right. Instead of trying to sell something to China, which was nonsensical, China is a poor country. There is no mass market in China at that time. People don't have money to buy anything. But buy Chinese goods. No, not buy Chinese goods. Buy Chinese, the, the greatest Chinese commodity they have, cheap labor. And finally, a key technology had to be invented, the shipping container. And then the second technology, which I already mentioned, Unicode. Oh, uh, we're not going to get into that. We don't have time. But the key technology that made globalization possible, that surged, that surged the Chinese economic engine, was the shipping container. Before, to, make, to try to leverage Chinese labor, cheap Chinese labor, you had to load the ship with Chinese goods. Before the shipping container, it took 30 days to load a ship. Once it docked in port, it took 30 days to unload a ship. For those of you older than 50, remember all those horrible longshoremen strikes when we were scared to death? The longshoremen, the ship unloaders would go on strike? They bring the economy to a standstill. This did away with all that. We had cheap Chinese labor load this box at the factory, put it on a container ship, it takes less time to put to fill out the paperwork for a container than to put it on the ship. <laughs> this arrives in Port Porto, Los Angeles. It's a reverse process. It's unloaded real fast. Put the container on railroad cars. Put the container on trailers. Go to market. Make money. All right. They call it the factory in China. Make more. Make more. We sold all this stuff. 
ends up being cheaper. Uh, the, this keeps going until they say, no, we can't make anymore. Why? Factory's maxed out. Oh, okay. Then money starts flowing the other way. Capital to make more factories. China becomes the world's workshop. Computers, fast jet, jet travel, overnight package delivery, data network, satellites, all this stuff, they're important. They support globalization. But what created globalization was the shipping container, intermodal transportation. And of course, we have the Unicode, the computerization of Chinese language. China today, huge trade deficit, our big trade partner, an economic juggernaut, trillions in trade cash reserves, trade deficit reserves, biggest buyer U.S. debt. Their industrial uh, infrastructure is built up, factory to the world, millions out of poverty, now an emerging superpower. They're now the second largest economy in the world. They will be the biggest by the end of this decade. And they will be aiming for military parity with us. Those immediate goals and issues, future ambitions, keep their gains, and then expand them. Bring more people out of poverty, give them a better standard of living, feed them better food, meat, for one. Issues and goals, energy. They're going on a territorial grab because they think there may be oil in their island. And I guess we're not out of time. But I'm not done, I may have to come back. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's well, thank our speaker. Yeah. Uh, got our money's worth tonight. Yes, sir. Well, we uh, okay, sir. thank Phil for uh, going through three millennia at least and, uh, and giving us an overview of uh, Chinese and uh, Western history by the alphabet. <laughs> okay. Uh, I see questions. Uh, Dan, Dan, Dan Weinberg in the back there. Oh. Um, is, it, oh. is it too late? Is it too late for China to get a an alphabet? Um. Well, given the fact that the Chinese language is homonymic, is a monosyllabic, then you wind up with homonymic confusion. I don't think it was ever too late, it just never arrived. It's not practical, that, as I can see it. All right, Don. Okay, um, I, I, my understanding is that, it, now isn't uh, Korean language uh, also monosyllabic, and don't they have, they have a phonetic al uh, writing system. Yes, I'm not too familiar with it. Okay, I, okay, but, all right, but anyway, that's a country that has has that's mo has But they language. they began with a with a character based language. Oh, I know. It was I the know, Korean I know, king who I know, inaugurated I know the story. it. Yeah, I know the story. Yeah. Uh, 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 why a few years ago, uh, Turkey under a, uh, a leader named Ataturk, uh, they he, he forced the country to trap the uh, Cyrillic alphabet. No, 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 Arabic. Arabic. Western alphabet. Arabic. So I would, I would like to ask you why didn't China just adopt the Western alphabet? Again, an alphabet is impractical for the Chinese language. It's monosyllabic. An alphabet, transliterization of Chinese pronunciation into an alphabet-based system would just create confusion. Too many words use the same syllable. Oh. Too many words use the same syllable. Are there any Chinese philosophers or Chinese thinkers who agree with this theory that you have? Well, believe it or not, Mao himself saw the need for a Chinese alphabet. But it never went anywhere because of the problems I just said. I have run into a number of Asians whom I've never met, but we're chatting over coffee or lunch, and they came up with the same conclusions. I also, uh, my experience with a lot of immigrant Chinese, rank and file, they hate this hypothesis because to me, they think I'm a traitor to the culture. I talk to Chinese Americans, and they're going, When is this book coming out? We've got to read this. All right. Uh, 
A very primitive one. Sort of. right? A lot of Japanese uh, written languages borrow from Chinese. Okay, it's called kanji. Uh, the most famous, two famous kanji words that we know in our country comes from World War II, kamikaze, divine wind. When you spell out the words, the, the characters are kamikaze, it's the same in Chinese as it is in Japanese. Right. They were so much more advanced than China. Not more advanced, but Not the, pro the, the problem out. was they recognized the Western challenge. When, when uh, Commodore Perry broke, you know, forced his way to Tokyo Harbor with a gunboat and said to, China, to Japan, you will now be in contact with the rest of the world. And the Japanese uh, ruling, ruling people said, whoa, the white man is here to stay. There's just, we can't ignore him like we have for years or cut ourselves off or ignore him like China. He's here, we can't get rid of him. What we must do, we must reorganize our society to answer the Western challenge. What happened next was amazing. They said that the Shogun had to resign and the emperor had to come back to rule. And the Shogun's family had ruled since, 1600, since the 1600s. What was amazing was the, the, the emperor's family had been out of power for over 200 years, but the man who stepped up was named Miiji, and he was ready. He wasn't somebody growing up in a cloister somewhere, like a prince regent. Okay, he was ready to lead the nation, all right? And within 1860 to 1895, well, slightly ahead, the British, the Japanese military said, we're no longer samurai, there will be no longer nobility. The only noble family will be the emperor. We will control the new military structure, all right? But no more samurai. And they built a navy, which defeated Tsarist Russia. They built an army, which beat China and took away Korea and Taiwan. In 35 years, they westernized because they made a conscious decision to do so. China, even without enough. Even without enough. Yeah. Uh, you made a statement that uh, China was right. communist then. I've heard this said from radio or whatever from some speaker. And I want to know why you say then. If they're not communists now, what are they? And if the officials there and the high people that control, what do they call themselves? Well, uh, to borrow a page from the Republicans, uh, the Chinese are communists now in name only. Uh, part of the constellation of factors was China finally got its ideology right. All right. Some time ago, China said Marxism is dead. The writings of a of a of a German writing in Karl Marx writing in 1860, his prescriptions cannot possibly a, a, apply to China in the 1980s, 120 years later. So Marxism was thrown out. China technically, by name, is still communist, but it is now a strange mixture of state control, industry, and capitalism. It's a weird hybrid critter. Are you all on? Uh, you are aware, I'm going back to the Semitic comment, mm -hmm. uh, you are aware that uh, although they don't, the Semitic language doesn't have uh, vowels, or started without vowels, they had a system, a, symbol, a system of symbols equivalent to the vowels. What's later? Which were those dots. dots yeah, that was uh, Are they inferior? Do you see them as inferior to vowels? I can't answer that question. I was not aware of the existence of what you just said. Oh. Repeat the question. That uh, the Semitic languages did have something that approximated vowels. Uh, I've not going across that in my researches. The, the, uh, today, the Semitic okay. languages, Hebrew and Arabic, do have vowels, but they were later additions. Right. And I don't know about Arabic as much, but archaic Hebrew is still written without vowels, but for the last 800 or 1,000 years, Hebrew has been written with additional vowel marks. Oh, um, Arabic uses these little po so-called right. polka dots. So does Hebrew. Same deal. So does Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah, they, they Tell us a little bit about that the, guy, the British diplomat in World War II, the man who loved China. Just tell us a little bit about what he did and what his legacy is. Ah, Joseph Needham, uh, arguably the greatest China scholar the Western world has ever produced. He became in love with Chinese culture to the point where he was really quite undiscriminating about Chinese culture. He loved everything about Chinese culture. And he saw the country during World War II. 
And he fell in love with it, with the place and the culture and the people, and devoted his life to becoming a China scholar. He wrote uh, Science and Civilization in China. Was it nine volumes or was it ten? Nine. Nine volumes. I think he began the tenth. And people said, Joseph, uh, how old are you now? Do you think you're going to finish this thing? I said, well, I don't know, but I got to start it. He didn't finish it. Okay. Uh, the greatest, uh, there's a great book out about him called The Man Who Loved China. If you want a good story about the biography of this man, uh, read this book. But there are those who criticized Needham regarding the alphabet hypothesis. Needham thought the alphabet hypothesis was absolute, the no alphabet hypothesis was absolute rubbish that the Chinese language was in no way an impediment to the rise of science in China. Uh -huh. <laughs> if I understood you correctly, you said at the beginning that the lack of an alphabet prevented them from doing science or mathematics. Mm -hmm. How do they do science or mathematics today without an alphabet? Today? Yeah. Oh, they become westernized in their methodologies. Yeah. What, what language do they use for mathematics? Well, it would be Chinese. Because I've seen Chinese geometry texts when I was a kid. I said, well, how do they... Well, apparently it is able to do mathematics without alphabet. But yes, but they couldn't create it. It's after the fact. It's imported. Well, how do they create mathematics today without an alphabet? I'm not up to date on the state of Chinese theoretical mathematics today. I don't know if they actually do it. But in terms of uh, technology subjects in their universities, engineering, science, right? Generally, it's taught in English because the Chinese language simply isn't precise enough to do it, to handle the job. <laughs> uh, Charlie is next. And then this. Charlie? See you live? <laughs> All right, Bill. Now, you can go to the second the center there, the first floor of the Art Institute, and you see the best. Chinese ceramics, mm -hmm. and the colors aren't quite perfect. Now, when the Europeans decided to make ceramics, you go to the basement, the decorative arts, you see these incredible figurines with enormous detail. What thousand times beyond what you just saw mm -hmm. I, it has nothing to do with the alphabet. Not from the same century. Speak as we got. Yeah, one, one full of time. You, they decided to make ceramics. And there's no comparison. It has nothing to do with an alphabet. It seems to me there has to be some other variables. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, but they, I'm not sure there is a question. They, no, the Chinese, I'll be honest with you, Chinese ceramics is kind of not quite there. <coughs> And then you go to the other culture, and it's just perfection. And they even took an art that supposedly belongs to China and perfected it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has anything to do with the alphabet. Right. I mean, how did that happen? I don't know, but I don't think it's relevant to this discussion. It has nothing to do with the alphabet. Well, Marina. I, why didn't you just gonna, date, time? I'm going to ask a question. They Somewhat were better at it, but we'll just, uh, than they were. Yeah. This is a little bit irrelevant. I'm wondering if you may have glanced into this. Written music. Is there a Chinese form of, of written music? Yes, there is. Uh, it's an eight-tone system, and to the Western ear, it sounds like a live cat being sawed in half. It's really jarring to the Western ear. I hate it. <laughs> Yeah, with uh, Unicode, uh, how are the uh, pictographs and or symbols represented? Yes, are they I haven't been able to... Arbitrarily decided upon, or...? I haven't figured it out yet, okay? I have the research materials. I haven't gone through it in detail yet. I, I suspect it's related to those barcodes that you see, that you can read on your smartphone. I don't know. I can, I can answer about Unicode. Okay. Um, in, in the systems derived from the telegraph, mm -hmm. each character has a number. Right, an ASCII value. And they're small numbers. Mm -hmm. Unicode is a system that begins with very large numbers, and the idea is that there are enough numbers that every character anywhere can have its own number. 
So a Western alphabet might have, with uppercase and lowercase and punctuation, might have a couple of dozen Unicode numbers, whereas Chinese will have tens of thousands of Unicode numbers, but every character, the, the Unicode uses the word glyph. Right. Every glyph has a code number, so whatever character you want to write, you, you use that number. Right, but that's the, the mathematical substrate of Unicode. My question is, how when I write certain strokes, Unicode recognizes that, that character? Well, Unicode is a system for coding it. The input is a whole different situation. Ah. And yeah, Chinese uh, keyboards are notoriously <laughs> Baroque. <laughs> Byzantine. <laughs> You've got the same problem, how do you figure out which symbol goes with which number in Unicode? Say again. How do you figure out which which glyph goes with which number in Unicode if there's no system to it? He just answered that question with a kind of a punch. For example, um, one system is to use a Western style keyboard and type in the syllable that is the Chinese word. Pinyin. But that syllable will actually be one of ten or a dozen words and then the, the computer shows you all dozen words and you pick out the one that you want so and go on to the next word. So the, the problem of entering it and the problem of a system for coding and recording it are, are, are somewhat separate. They're not, they're not quite the same question. Unicode deals with how it's recorded or how it's played back and displayed, but the entry problem is is not directly what Unicode is about. Unicode is a coding system. Okay. Uh, do you still have your question? No. All right. You. Uh, All right. Give her a microphone. Yeah. I'm an international student. I'm a grad student at Northwestern. I study Chinese art and history. So I want to study the ancient Chinese uh, language, and also ancient Chinese um, using in the, I think 2000 BCE and uh, until the uh, traditional Chinese and also uh, simple Chinese. So for the Chinese, I have uh, for the especially for the writing system, I want to say that the Chinese characters were made of two part. One part shows the uh, meaning for the Chinese character and then another part shows the pronunciation. So I'm wondering how the uh, for this is uh, the, the Chinese and the, it starts from the, the ancient part until today we follow the same system so I'm wondering how then you connect the, the alphabetic or the, the Chinese language system to the Chinese modernity and then also for another question then I think then the Chinese modernity starts from the, the early 20th century is that instead of from the, the 1978 uh, although for that uh, for the first period and during the Republican period China the, the modernity then China not finally become a very a modern country but the modernity starts from that time uh, instead of the the, uh, the the 1970s so I feel a little confused about the uh, the, the modernity. You uh, the, your definition about the modernity in China, and also my third question is about the uh, technology and or uh, technology and also the, the Chinese culture and the Chinese language. It seems that you said that the, for the Chinese, uh, the Chinese language determines that the China cannot have mathematics, and also. So because of Chinese do not have modern have mathematics, then the China cannot be a modern country. They don't have modern technology. But I still cannot figure out then, the logic between the mathematics and then, the writing system. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first off, uh, Chinese mathematics. I'm not saying that the Chinese mind cannot understand mathematics. I'm just saying that notation of Chinese mathematics did not originate in China because you needed an alphabet for that to happen. Uh, second, uh, modernity. Uh, there we have an honest 
we can have um, a disagreement there. But then I can see your point of view, all right? That my chosen date of 1978, I will admit, can be to a degree um, arbitrary. But that's when the practicality of modernity began. That's when China really started catching up to the world. Now, the beginning of the 20th century, Modernity, you could say modernity began because China yearned to be a modern country at that time. I mean, they declared China a republic in 1911. China had yearnings for modernity. But China really didn't start making significant progress to joining the modern world and become a modern nation, modern superpower. That process didn't begin until 1978 with Deng Xiaoping coming to power. And second, uh, the connection of the alphabet or the lack of an alphabet to modernity, I thought I, th I thought I covered that. This is my whole thesis, that the alphabet would give rise to notational mathematics, which you can do in paper and pencil, which gives rise to science, which gives rise to technology, which gives rise to progress. There were certain impediments to the nature of technology, modern, evolving modern technology, which shut China out of the modernity game. The Chinese language could not become mechanized, it could not become electrified, it could not become computerized until now. And those, when those technologies first came into play, the Chinese language could not be accommodated. That has all changed. And that's why it's a whole new world. Uh, I might say that China's future ambition is to force a whole new world order. I see nothing wrong with that. That's a very natural thing to do. It's going to be a natural consequence anyway, even if they didn't intend it. But there was a great metaphor that China had during the uh, 2008 Olympics in Beijing, when they had the March of Nations. Up until then, every Olympic was held in a Western nation, and the March of Nations were the delegations, the athletes would march out in alphabetical order. That didn't happen in the 2008 Olympics. The, the, the athletes marched out on a national order dictated by the Chinese names of those countries, and they counted the strokes in those names of those countries, and the countries, the athletic delegations, marched in order according to stroke number, the names of their country. That is a metaphor. The, most of the world didn't get it. I saw it. I said, uh-huh. That's China's message to the world. We're arriving. We're coming. Watch out. We are... We may have some sharp elbows getting our way to the table, but we are becoming an emerging superpower, and the 21st century may well be the Chinese century. Uh, all right. All right. Yeah. Can you give him a microphone? Mike. Can we discuss this concept? I basically viewed it as an observation on your part. And now that you've become rather uh, firm in your resolve that China's going to take over the world, and I, and, well, just a second, I'm not through. I'm not through. And I, I got you to change the title because it was a rather arrogant statement on your part, if I can say so. Are you now saying that they should adopt their own alphabet? Why, why reinvent the wheel? They're, oh, they're, they're in our universities up and down the coast of California where I went, and they're doing very well. So I'm, I'm a little confused. Maybe you could uh, tell me where I'm going wrong. By not listening. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Um, the question would be, my answer would be another question, in what language are they studying? I ran into a young Chinese lady at the Panera, and she saw my work. And we started talking. She was a physics student. She was about 22, 23 years old. She was in this country to study physics. And she agreed with everything I said. Born in China and agreeing. Now, let me, let me finish. When she came here, she said she had to learn English to further her studies in physics. The knowledge of English was essential. And then she was taking a, a course, and she went stayed after class to talk to a college professor All right, with a, simple, with a question. And the, she, she said, the college professor told her, but oh, just look that up in the, th that's simple, just look it up in the index. She had no idea what an index was. And when she found out about it, it was a revelation and an epiphany to her. Now, why reinvent the wheel? It's not reinventing the wheel. The wheel just simply can't be adapted to that vehicle. Now, let's give the, 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 the example of India. 
When the British left India in 1947, the Indians said, okay, the British have gone home. Now what can we keep for the British colonial legacy? Let's keep the English language. This is our way of organizing and unifying our country. Well, we can't, there's 200 languages in India, all right? Two main ones, but 200 languages. And they said, okay, we will conduct all university education in English. And that's the way we're going to unify our country, by making higher education based on one language, English. And when you, when you see educated Indians coming over to this country, language is never a problem because that English was their basis of higher education. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, anybody who has not had a question. Oh, Brian. Uh, Ryan. 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 So, so I think you made a very strong case for how not having an alphabet is an impediment. But I'm not sure it really convinces me that it's 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 the only thing that was that that kind of set a roadblock around 1200 for the for the Chinese civilization, uh, or, or even maybe the primary one. Because what what was it about that that would would say that nothing more from this point forward was it really that logical, or was it more of some of some other social issues? There may have been other ways around the the impediments that I mean you obviously don't see in Western civilization, but there may have been other paths to follow um, that wouldn't would, would that they would have gone down if, if they had more time to get past other problems they were at. You know, like their their isolationism and so forth. I'm not sure I understand the question. It's well, so in the 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 they, around 1200 or something, they they were working on going to Africa, and they canceled that oh, later. Oh, Jack Hall's fleet, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and was me. Was me. I guess I guess actually, if I want to make it succinct, it's the Jared Diamond philosophy of like the, the guns, germs, and steel, and the the the, ge the geography and right. so forth, as far as being like the major impediment to to their progress at that time and then the clash of civilizations coming together and them being behind at the time that that occurred. Well, just remember, China was the ascendant civilization of the ancient world. They were top dog. Okay. But then they came to a dead end. After 1115 AD, nothing new in terms of technology and science came out of China. Nothing. I'll pay you five bucks if you can name something. But it doesn't. It isn't there. But what, what's the proof that, that that was because of the alphabet? I thought my presentation explained that. And if my presentation is not adequate for that, I have no answer for that. Okay. I think it's just a, uh, we'll get a chance to rebut in the rebuttal period yeah, I'm on your stuff. Have, well, okay, I'm afraid that we've run out of time for questions. We've got rebuttals now. The rebuttal period uh, gives you a chance uh, to enlighten the rest of us with your questions, your your knowledge, uh, your <laughs> uh, opinions. And uh, I want to see in the hands of those who have such to impart to the rest of us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, right, uh, up to uh, four minutes apiece. Well, we have chairs over here that. Yeah, I think yeah, about four minutes so that our speaker will have the final word uh, to uh, correct any uh, rebuttals that uh, miss the point. I have Okay. It. I've got the timer. All right. Very good. Thank you, Tim. Uh, all right. Let's Starting get started. with uh, Dan Weinberg. <laughs> Four minutes. 
Strictly at four, four minutes. Four minutes? Up, uh, up to. Okay. 20 four minutes. minutes. Okay. I just have a short poem about uh, China. Mm. Yeah, okay. see my nose. All right. Timing me? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Here are 30 seconds. Calm down. Times like today, the times like today, the only voice she hears comes with the mashed potatoes and coffee at the restaurant. 75 winters already. Uh, my wife is going to sing a little song, uh, English song today. I hope you all enjoy it. I still got two minutes of my time, right? Who's the timekeeper? Ilana Weinberg. Come on, oh, now. Come on, come on. Faster. It's not Lithuania, Latvia. Lithuanian opera, it's beautiful. Here you go. Well, I did. You didn't taste the two things. All right, come on. Okay. One minute. Okay. I'm going to get you Well, I'm from Over and over, I keep going over. alphabet uh, was introduced into China or to non-Chinese people living elsewhere in the world. It was called, as our speaker said, pinyin. Uh, it consists of the Latin alphabet, but because in uh, 
in Mandarin Chinese, there are three tones to a language. It's difficult to make an alphabet uh, with tones. Cantonese has eight tones. It's very difficult to do that. That's why the pictorial images are understandable by both Mandarin and Chinese. And by the way, in Vietnam, they have 12 tones. So you, you, you have to be specific when you say that. And my Chinese, not very good. I studied for two years, uh, and I can read about 600 Chinese characters. That's the equivalent of a kindergarten child in China. And no more. Um, the math of mathematics of the Greeks um, and the Romans was, was difficult for them too, although they managed it. Um, the Greeks didn't have a numerical system, uh, the Arabic numerals. They had their alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, etc., representing their, their, the numbers. Um, and, 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 and so did uh, uh, the Roman. Can you imagine trying to multiply in Roman numerals? <laughs> very difficult. And yes, they had engineers uh, also. Um, I guess that's all. Is the speaker around or not? He's over here. He's over here. Not yet? Oh, he's over there. Well, I just want to say that this was a very, very, very good presentation. Uh, I couldn't take any... Hey! Jesus! God damn it! Why don't you shut up, you down there? I knew you had something else to say. I say thank you for a very good presentation. And that uh, I was born of uh, Spanish people who knew a lot about the Chinese history and they admire very much. Uh, my grandfather was very burst of all the uh, Chinese uh, uh, advances and technologies and literature and poetry. So the speaker today made sense of the, why the Chinese uh, was left behind after the Europeans came to the Americans and the use of the slave labor to get gold and silver and use that to uh, give energy to their development of uh, <clears throat> the steam engines and the railroads and so on and their uh, powerful ships with big cannons and so on. So I thank you very much for the speaker. Well, yeah, wherever the speaker is, if he can see me, I have to echo what Frank said about it's one of the best presentations we've ever had here. And likewise, with respect to his conduct in the Q&A, I guess the way I will put it is, hey, there you go, right, I, would, I will say to you, sir, as far as you're in the Q&A, Mitsuhito, hi, okay, uh, so, and uh, to uh, just elaborate and add some historical stuff, not directly pertinent to your thesis, but nonetheless possibly of interest, with respect in particular to Gutenberg and his significance. A generation or so before him, you had Jan Hus, and he had to try to scrape together an army of scribes. That was the only ball game in town for him, and he couldn't do it fast enough, and they got his, and they went and they burned his ass. All right. Now, a generation or so after Gutenberg, Luther had the, uh, you know, had, had the, the, the elector of Württemberg. You know, I don't know if the elector had a bunch of printing presses in his basement of his castle, or whether they were they were printing presses spread all throughout the, pro you know, there like five of them. Okay, okay, you know. But in any case, so you, it was possible for dudes to ride through town with saddlebags full of 95 theses, just passing them for out for free. And Hoos didn't have that, so they were able to get Hoos in time to fry him. By the time they thought of frying Luther, 
the cat was out of the bag and they had a hornet's nest on their hands and they didn't know what to do. So they just sort of, you know, the stuff just kept happening and they lost control of everything. Exactly. There you go. And then once that happened with him, then you had the Cromwells and the Tom Paines playing the same game. And that was what brought and as the Western Europe, you know, the Western, it was sort of started there and it came over here, changes in the political system to make adjustments and circumstances, whereas China just had the same old imperial system for the next 400 years. And they went and, you know, the, 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 they couldn't go nowhere in terms of organizing their population any better, whereas Napoleon was able to put a nation in, of, in arms on the battlefield and replenish casualties and fight wars just year after year and whatnot. And the others, even if the Chinese, and by that time, my guess is that even if they'd had enough of it, this stuff going on where these Europeans could make these kind of adjustments, they'd have got whooped anyway is my guess. Um, and to add to it, it's striking, and there, I'm sure I don't have time to get into this, it's a hell of an interesting coincidence that you ended up with, you know, at the very far end of Asia, on the one hand, China and Japan, with China leading the way until roughly the 12th century, and way at the other end of the, of, of the, of the big, um, what do they call it, the, the, the supercontinent, or I forget what they call it, Eurasia, um, you know, you had the Brits. And the Brits ended up leading the way. Two islands, or folks in the case of the frogs and the Germans, close to islands. Maybe there's a coincidence there, if you see what I mean. If you're familiar at all with Bill McNeil of U of C, who writes about stuff like this, about where, how geography comes into play, and how Greece was a bunch of little islands right next to each other, so you could have Sparta and Athens and all these outfits close enough to each other to learn from each other but with defensible frontiers against each other that they couldn't be swallowed up. Whereas the Middle East, it's a rough neighborhood. Where were you going to build a wall in the Middle East to keep the bad guys out? So it was, you know, you had to be hatched from a cannonball, as Napoleon would put it, about Prussia. And so these religions in particular of the Middle East were hatched out of cannonballs because they had no choice. It was either be hatched from a cannonball or go down the drain. <laughs> Time. Would you like to be my speaking partner? <laughs> Time. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Let me know what you mean. Good try. And now, uh, uh, here's a good example of uh, the intelligence level of capitalism. Uh, yeah, anybody here have a Charter One bank account? Anybody? Uh, here, I, um, they were charging me uh, ten dollars a month to pay no interest. So I go in and I close the account, and here's the receipt. It says closed account, and then I get a threatening letter in the mail. You will be reported to a collection agency for for this a penny, one penny. Anybody got any ideas on how to embarrass Charter One? See me, see me later. Facebook. Uh, Thank you, Greg Hudson. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I'd have to concur with Jeff and um, that this this is one of the best presentations we've had at the College of Complexes. Um, I thought it was an ec excellent excellent presentation. Uh, now uh, there's there's a few things that I would um, take issue with. First of all, I, I don't think that the Greeks didn't. They produced some great philosophers, but they didn't really invent philosophy because around the same time, China was producing um, great philosophers too, such as uh, such as Confucius and Lao Tse. And uh, now, uh, the second thing that I would just say in, in response to what you just said about about religions that develop in the Middle East and to be hatched in a cannonball. Uh, that wasn't Christianity developed in pretty much the same country. Just well, let me finish, Jeff. Same country as Judaism, yeah. and uh, and it didn't develop that way. Uh, now, um, all right. Now the second thing I would just now in, there is one other one other possible uh, cause why China may not have progressed much after um, after around 1200, and that was the. Uh, the Mongol invasion of China, which uh, also occurred in um, in the Middle East, uh, in Baghdad, for example, in the Persian Empire, and it set them back considerably. Now, 
Um, the other thing they mentioned, I think somebody brought up the uh, voyage, I think it was Ryan over here brought up the voyages of Admiral Chung Ho. Uh, that was actually in the, not in the, in the 1200s, that was actually in the 1400s when that happened. Um, that's kind of interesting, what if, because, because he, they sent ships that were actually bigger and better than the ships that had, Europe had at that time, and they explored the whole Indian Ocean all the way down to the east coast of Africa. And um, they didn't. Uh, they didn't try to conquer everything in sight, though. Um, they, uh, unlike the, the Portuguese, when they got to the Indian Ocean and the other European powers, they actually came to trade rather than to um, rather than to just conquer everything they could. Here's a good book on this subject. This is one person's. This is Noam Chomsky and his take on why Western civilization wound up. Uh, uh, ruling more territory than the others. Year 501, the conquest continues. His argument basically is that the Westerners took over because they're more aggressive and warlike than everybody else. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, uh, I would just say to Jeff that um, that Christianity, of course, was uh, wasn't it wasn't didn't develop like Islam. Its founder wasn't a um, was not a conqueror. All right, now. The term the Renaissance wasn't used by people at the time of the Renaissance. They, uh, that was a term coined by 18th century historians and um, uh, who also were the first people, they're 18th century European historians, I should say, and they were also the first people to divide history into ancient, medieval times, and modern times, and then the Renaissance was their term for the division, as they saw it, between the Middle Ages and modern times. Now. Uh, now, one thing that you're mistaken about, uh, uh, Mr. Fong, is that there was literature written in, the, in Europe, in the vernacular, before uh, Gutenberg developed movable type. Um, there's a number of works. Of course, Dante wrote in Italian before movable type. Uh, there were works that Chaucer wrote in English. Uh, there, was, uh, there were also many works in, in French. Uh, all right. Now, now, on the subject of, alpha, of, of alphabets, yes, Korea... Uh, and, 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 and we alluded to that before, uh, Mr. Fung, that the, the, at a certain point, the king of Korea developed a phonetic alphabet which replaced the Chinese script in Korea. And, and although Korea is a monosyllabic language, uh, they ha actually do have a phonetic alphabet. Uh, so it is possible. Uh, it may not, but however, it's, the Korean is not the same as Chinese, and it may be because of what you were talking about, uh, some of the differences between Chinese may make it difficult. But now, the other thing... The, you mentioned before that the Beijing, Olymp the Beijing Olympics of 2008 being the, the first not in the West. Well, there was had already been two Olympics in Japan, one in Tokyo, one in Sapporo, time. and Seoul. And, and I just have been informed that I'm out of time. So I would just before parting, I would just also like to recommend another book for a different take on this subject, Why the West Rules for Now by Ian Morris. He talks about the same subject as Mr. Fong. He doesn't bring language into it. I'll see how far I can get through my comments in my time. Um, our speaker uh, uh, very properly credited the book The Alphabet Effect, which has a lot of the material that he used, and I cannot recommend the book too highly. Uh, the Alphabet Effect probably has more ideas per page than almost any book I've ever seen. It is stunning. It's very clear the guy is an avid fan of and disciple of Marshall McLuhan. The book is marvelous. Uh, there's another book people might be interested in. It's much more it, uh, a scholarly piece of history, which means it's more expensive and it's larger. But the title is The Printing Press as an Agent of Change by Elizabeth Eisenstein. And I'm a tech geek, and this book is one of my touchstones in looking at the internet, because the printing press took 200 years to shake out, and among other things, the printing press resulted in Protestantism as we know it, it resulted in science as we know it, and it resulted in nationalism as we know it. One of the early definitions of a nationality is a dialect which is in print. What became Italian? What became German, French, Spanish? Um, I have two quick historic notes I want to stick in. Somebody mentioned the Mongols. When the Mongols came out of Central Asia, their first military defeat was in front of Cairo, Egypt. The city of Baghdad, which had been a giant, brilliant center, 
burned for a week. Uh, the, the folkloric account says the river ran black with the ink of the books that the Mongols threw in. And because the Arab civilization was smashed, taking the brunt of the Mongol assault, Europe was spared. So there's some complex interplay there. Um, right now, today, if, if you follow that sort of news, uh, the expression, the Great Firewall of China, um, is a pun referring to the Chinese government censorship of the internet, and the common and vernacular tug of war is puns, because people will take a, a, an, a very neutral phrase which sounds the same as the forbidden word. And this goes back in our own folklore, uh, supposedly Coca-Cola means bite the wax tadpole. But the, the, the central thesis is that the intellectual process of reading alphabetic writing is different from the intellectual process of reading ideographic writing. I can take a book that's in German, and I can, you know, allowing for my hopeless Midwestern accent, I can make the sounds of the German words, and somebody who knows German can understand the book I'm reading from even though I don't. I can take a book written in Chinese, and if I know the ideograms, I can read what it says, even if I have no clue what it will sound like. This is, and, and when I'm, you all, we all remember the school teacher telling us to sound out the words. This is an intellectual process which has no analog in reading Chinese. And one of the crucial distinctions is that in alphabetic writing, words come apart. Words have parts. So we have monotheism, we have codes of law, we have alphabetic order, we have logic. Um, we have a whole different way of understanding what things are because our, our speaking is so different. Uh, I'm like to several other speakers here. If I, if I knew this speaker, uh, I would know his character, I would know what he is, but I, if I knew that, I would give him my tuition now. But I don't want to insult him, because he did a job that I remember, I mean, that was, was uh, like the one that you get at the university when the speaker come in from the other, other schools and so forth. But anyway, I'm not in a position to uh, correct this speaker about the history of uh, uh, China and so forth and so on, but I, he, he, he helped me remind me of certain things I read and certain things I know because of my age. And, 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 uh, uh, and that is, uh, uh, there are many countries that was ahead and above of other countries that failed. And we could start with Rome, and there are a written reason why Rome failed, et cetera, and so forth. But I got four minutes, so let's not go into that. There are uh, uh, countries like Egypt. At one time, they had the reputation of China in the old world. And <laughs> they are there now, not there now. Uh, uh, the, the mine down in Central America, uh, uh, we read about them and their level of intelligence, their level of investment in science and, and all kinds of things. When the Europeans got here, they had to learn something from the mind, like uh, astrology, et cetera, and so forth. We also know about Greek. I mean, who, who was more uh, uh, intelligent, at least to me, because I'm kind of got a weakness for philosopher and, 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 and the, uh, the classic, like Homer, and Euripides, and so forth and so on. And they was top notch to me from the reading about them and so forth and so on. <laughs> a few months ago, I was looking at television and standing in line to get bread with covers over their faces and so forth and so on. So many countries have failed, and a lot of them failed because of their own conduct. And one of the countries that I can remember flying high, at least uh, reading about it, after flying high, was Germany. And again, you 
I know about these countries from reading uh, Hegel's and Nietzsche and Kant and, and the music from Broad and Wagner and so forth and so on. You say, oh, these are br brilliant folks. But then when you look at World War II and leading up to World War II and what the people was being sold verbally and otherwise, you want to say, Jesus Christ, what do this leadership, what do this brilliance, what does this academic achievement uh, 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 don't on the positive side of this country. So we all know what happened to Germany. <laughs> we all know what happened to Germany in 1945. When Fuhrer uh, committed suicide and we bombed them into Olition and they were nothing despite all of the history that they had behind them. And I'll leave now because I don't want to be like my president. He said, this is the prettiest woman in the world and so forth so on. Can you huh. believe that? Give me a break, please. You don't make mistakes like that. And they got all kinds of rightful uh, uh, come in, like women say. Now see, that's why we ain't got to keep fighting. You see him, he just like the rest of them. And they was right. So I go along with the women. He didn't have no right to be saying, but I'm not, I'm not right. I'm saying, his, his, his thinking was, was foggy for him to say that. I'm saying, even if I wasn't president, I wouldn't say that around some intelligent women because the first thing you are saying to a woman is, you got to be good looking in order to do this and do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker again as we have on several occasions. I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Um, I've got to begin, all right, I'll begin by correcting you. Bill, uh, everyone reads by rote memory. Uh, can anybody here tell me the short vowel sounds? Uh, 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 uh. You do not read phonetically. It would take you an hour to read one page, to read a street sign. You, at traveling, you cannot do it. We read by rote memory. I, I mean, I had a brief career trying to teach Johnny how to read, but I came up with a basic word frequency of the words in the English language and worked on the flash kind of memory situation here, but basic vocabulary. We do, in fact, read by rote memory, even in an alpha, Roman alphabet system here. Uh, so I don't know if that's really the totality of it. I can certainly appreciate as the librarian the difficulty trying to organize dictionaries or records on based on the number. I've seen this thing. Yeah, I've tried this with the number of strokes of it in a character. It's just not a workable solution. The other thing you're tossing around here is um, modernity. Well, what is modernity? Are you talking about the standards set by the Western culture for achievements in the arts and technology? Um, and why I'd like to know is, let's, if, if you want to call it the Anglo-American culture, setting the standard in this regard. Not only for, for China, for the world, what took place. There's been any number of books written trying to figure this out. I don't agree with all of them. Uh, to attribute, I mean, the achievements, I, I'm sorry, you, you, you gave the inventions of China about a half dozen, but the achievements of every single aspect, subject matter, human endeavor, the medicine, uh, metallurgy, music, uh, even warfare, the achievements of the Western culture are just incredible. I mean, in the hundreds of thousands, in the highest standards here. We had Lee Hubble, remember the late Lee Hubble spoke here because people, the women's liberation movement kept putting down the white European male, and he spoke an entire evening on the achievements of the white European male. And he said, we have nothing to apologize for, philosophy, any subject. He looked, at, looked into medicine, the great discoveries, Nobel Prizes, things like this. Why is this singular focus on, why are they setting the standards of modernity? I don't know. <laughs> I think there's a lot more operating here than, than encapsulating knowledge. I mean, as a librarian, I can certainly appreciate preserving knowledge and passing it on to others, dissemination aspect of it. 
in <laughs> preserving it for those who come later. But to say that blanketly it's just going to be the alphabet, I, I don't think it is, is quite there. Um, I, it's a good start. You know, I, I think um, there's a little more operative here. I'd like to know what, and, and the thing that's going on here, the other thing you cited your point is, so there's a transference from the west to the east. But what has happened in the east to make it not, I don't, I, it was unclear why they stagnated and what has happened other than an enormous transference of knowledge from the west. So that's not going to put you in first place if you're just getting stuff from elsewhere. You've got to, what is the transformative action? Innovation. Innovation. Uh, no, I'm serious. The, the shipping that's container just, in Unicode. What? The shipping, the shipping container. Here, here, the shipping right. container. The shipping containers, not, they're just making what we tell them to make. Time. Time. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Taking the prerogative of well, the, uh, the Koreans uh, not only invented an alphabet, which uh, uh, did not come into large use in Korea until uh, the missionaries uh, hit uh, Korea in the 1890s. Uh, the missionaries saw the use of an alphabet and made lots of literature and uh, established schools and taught the uh, hoi polloi how to uh, read their own language. And uh, it was very useful in, uh, for the Koreans uh, to have their, their own schools and their own language, especially uh, since they were conquered by the Japanese in 1905. Now, actually, the Koreans had also invented not only an alphabet, but the printing press before Gutenberg by about, I think, 25 years. Uh, they invented a, pr uh, a, a, a printing press, a movable type, and so on. Uh, but uh, since the written language in uh, Korea was uh, the province of Buddhist monks, uh, and uh, they were Chinese, uh, uh, they were schooled in Chinese writing, uh, they, uh, they never really developed their own alphabet uh, language until of the uh, evangelization of uh, the 1890s. A bit of history and uh, why the Koreans uh, are nationalists uh, and Korea, uh, Korea is a very different country. Okay. I think Mr. Fong made very clear tonight about how the rise of civilization bring, is brought about by the adoption of standards, by the adoption of universal methods of doing things, and that results in further innovation. I could think of a, not a better argument for capitalism presented tonight than what Mr. Fong did. When a country has the adoption of an alphabet or universal standards, people start talking, they get ideas, and they move forward. You notice that even with his English language word building, it was a lot easier than the Chinese language. A result of innovation, making things easier, making lives a little easier. That's why I'm a fan of capitalism. You have innovation, you have the adoption of ideas, and certainly with the adoption of things like the ASCII code, 
of, of HTTP has brought us a lot more than even their invention of the printing press, it is my contention at this point. <laughs> Those were government projects. They were government projects. The initial research was done by government. Once the commercial people adopted those standards, watch out. We took off like crazy. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Fong, for a very, very, very excellent presentation. Now let's go ahead. So, uh, first off, sorry about jumping ahead in their rebuttals period to QA. Um, but uh, so I think that I think that you made an extremely good case, uh, and I hadn't heard this this case in such detail before uh, about how uh, the alphabet was a major impediment to uh, the development of technology and so forth. Um, but I've heard additional theories, and I think that there is there is a sufficient case to be made that you, that. You haven't really ruled those out, and, and that it may be the interplay of those things, and that there's 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 the concern that um, you could certainly have gotten past that impediment. Uh, we don't necessarily know how somebody would have gotten past that impediment because it never happened, um, but uh, it's certainly theoretically possible. You know, like if you look at you know people have brought up some ideas like some of the things the Koreans are doing and I, I don't, you know. So um, that's, that's all I can say is that, you know, it, it don't try to attribute uh, one cause without ruling out all the others to, to being the impediment, being the thing. Well, I, I don't know, it's just the, the title seems like that. But I'm sorry if that, if that, if that, if that so I, I'm just, yeah. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm sure I missed a great talk. Um, said to Charlie we should have this as a two-parter. Um, a great book I read on the subject, which is very small, is something called Dreaming in Chinese. And it's a wonderful book about a person's experience of trying to learn Chinese. A, um, one thing I learned from that book was that saying I speak Chinese is the equivalent of saying I speak European. There's just at least five principal languages in China. Dialects. Dialects. Yeah. They call them dialects, even though they have five tones, three tones, two tones. tones. One cannot understand the other. It's not a dialect, it's a language. All right? That's like saying an Italian and a Spaniard speak the same language. Or like saying, I speak European. It's silly. Eh, my turn. All right? So you can't just say, like, I speak European. It, it just doesn't work. Or I speak Latin, meaning I speak Italian, German, Spanish, French. Um, the other thing was that I learned from that book the thing about tones. And like in English we have tones, but we don't use them the same way. So the example, you can say, I want to, do, you want this now? Or you can say, you want this now? Different tones, same word, now, or now, okay? And they, in, in English, we apply meaning to that, emphasis. Same word, though. In Chinese, different entire words. One of them can mean light bulb, the other one can mean soup kitchen. It's like just entirely different words, right? Which the author had difficulty, you know, speaking Chinese. The other thing is, um, the thing about Westerns, it's, it's, I, there was an author I went to see at the public library, he was Middle Eastern, he wrote a book about the, ch something about, not something, he wrote a book about the Western place, I, I'm not going to get this right, all right, he wrote a book, and in this book, he brought out the thing that it was the 1905 defeat of the Russian Navy by the Japanese had an impact across the non-Western world. And the reason was, was because the Westerners were finally defeated by a non-Western power. All right? 
because the rest of the world was so beaten down by their inability, not inability, their lack of competition with Western ideas. And then you get into like, what is a Western idea? Or the, what they, these other people in the world, South Americans, Africans, Middle East, India, and China had to face, all right, from like the 1700s on, okay? And we have like, just starting with music, we have like the violin, the viola, the cello, the bass, and then like, you have the invention of the saxophone, the alto sax, the bass sax. You have all the other instruments that make up the orchestra. You have like the Brahms or the early Bach and Bach's music, which evolved into Beethoven, which evolved into a romantic music, which evolved into another style, whatever that other one was, which gets into atonal, which gets into atonal music. And then the arts, just one more. The arts, you have like photography, film, and then film you have the famous thing of a horse running down the track, motion. serial photography, and then you have motion photography, and then you have silent movies, and then you have color movies, and then you have talkies. And the people in the world are like, oh my God. And the competition, like out of the West, it was just one thing after another building on itself. And the rest of the world was like, wow. Thank you. Well, at the risk of being repetitive, I will say this has, has definitely been one of the best presentations that I've heard in the many years that I have been coming to the College of Complexes. Well delivered, well constructed, very informative. I learned an awful lot and I, I enjoyed it. However, I, I, I have, first of all, I have, or second of all, I have a politically incorrect joke. But first, uh, I want to ask a question. If the Chinese are so far behind, how come so many Chinese are inv invading our schools and, and excelling? There was a case a few years ago in Boston, there are 17 major high schools, 14 of the valedictorians were Asian. When I graduated from my alma mater here in Chicago several years ago, I'm not sure that there was even one Asian student. There may have been a couple in a class of 600 or something, but I, I'm not sure. Today I go into the computer lab, and it's at least one-third to one-half Asian, and most of them are women. Maybe that's even more scary, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. But I do have, your joke reminded me of another joke I had. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wong are at the hospital for the arrival of their first baby. Oh, no. And when the baby is presented, the baby is obviously Caucasian. And Mr. Wong goes to the doctor and says, this can't be right, this can't be right. I'm a Wong, she's a Wong, two Wongs don't make a white. <laughs> Se second punchline. And then the doctor says, yes, but accidents do happen. <laughs> Let's get Mr. Wong up to rebut. Right, yeah. Wong. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Bill. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, uh, I'd like to talk, address the Charlie Pellet point that we read by rote memory. That is absolutely true. We read by rote memory because we learn by parsing, by alphabetic, by alphabetic parsing. But once we parse the word, it enters into rote memory. We don't parse street names, okay? Or we parse syllables. Syllables become familiar elements, and boom, 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 we put together Damon Avenue, Irving Park. Right? When you see the word dog, that's a simple word that has entered into our rote memory. But to enter it in our rote memory, we did it by alphabetic parsing. Okay. Uh, the last gentleman here, uh, I would have another strange joke about two, two Chinese guys who at a bar, and words are exchanged, they, get, they take umbrage and offense, they score off, they start, they're going to... They're gonna start screaming. They both find out their name. They, they, they find out they're both named Fong, so they let the whole matter drop. Just goes to show two Fongs don't make a fight. <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> um, the, the last thing about the, is, if, is Asia, if China is so far behind, why are we sending all these people? You know, Asian, 
why are there so spectacular performance by Asian students? Okay, well, China's not. China is caught up, all right, and I've never ever intimated that Chinese people uh, were shortchanged in intelligence anyway. The Chinese mind has its own strengths, um, and the Chinese mind, is, as far as I'm concerned, I know it's true in my case, the Chinese mind hungers for logic, and once organizing logic, and once it finds it, it takes to it like a duck to water. It's hungry for it, and we become very good at mathematics, computer programming, medicine, science, what have you. So I'm just, my only point was that all these things were not created in China. The Chinese can learn these things readily, rapidly. My only point is that these things did not originate in China. That's, that's basically my point. As far as other factors, um, the alphabet can't possibly explain everything. Yes, that's absolutely correct. There are other factors. There are other non-alphabetic factors. Uh, for instance, why didn't the Islamic world create modernity? Okay. Um, they had an alphabet, the Arabs had an alphabet, okay, and Arab science at one point was pretty darn sharp, pretty darn good. Well, two, several things happened in Europe that were non-alphabetic factors that were laid the role to modernity. Yeah. One was the separation of church and state, Martin Luther, no. the rise of Protestantism, okay? A separation of church and state. Europe used to fight religious wars, okay? Bloody, bloody, nasty things. They cleaned out the gene pool. Right. Uh, the Thirty Years' War was started as a religious struggle uh, in uh, Bohemia, in Prague. Uh, some Catholics burned down the Protestant church, so the Protestants burned down the Catholic church, and then tit for tat, the thing escalated into a war. It lasted decades. By the end of the thirty, toward the end of the Thirty Years' War, the war had stopped being religious in nature and became political. All right. Finally, said the European powers said, "Enough of this. We can't do this anymore. Religious wars are stupid." That was settled by the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, and from that point on, religious wars on a huge scale right, just didn't happen anymore. We had huge wars based on racism, like Nazi Germany, but not religion anymore. Okay? Then there was another separation in the Western culture, the separation of church and science. And that started with Galileo. But eventually, religion and science divided, and each had its own sphere, just like the division between temporal and canon power separation of church and state. In the Islamic world, uh, the separation of church and state has not happened. Today, the Islamic fundamentalists are always asking for a return to Sharia, Islamic law, fundamentalism, theocracy. The church is the state. All right? Now, the, there's another separation which didn't happen either, separation of church and science. Uh, at one point, Islamic science was tops. And then all of a sudden the Mullahs, the Ayatollahs, and the Imams said, no, 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 no. What's more important is religion. And religion became, took precedence, and science just kind of faded away. So there's a, those are non-alphabetic factors for what happened in the earth and what didn't happen in the Islamic world. Uh, China has another separation between church and what have you in order, in order to secure its future. The separation in this country, the separation of state and commerce. That has not happened in China. I don't know if it's ever going to happen in China. Too many state-owned industries in China. What makes this country great and powerful is the private sector. There is a separation. There's capitalism. And by the way, capitalism, as we know it, was a direct outgrowth of the printing press. Yep. Capitalism was, the printing press gave rise to capitalism directly because they real, people realized what a great idea printing, printing was, what, what Gutenberg, how good Gutenberg's idea was. So everybody started pooling their money to build printing presses, put them on, on wagons, start roaming around Europe, okay, and created printing businesses. But it took capitalism in its earliest form to make those businesses happen. And then uh, all the stuff happening in Europe, the runaway, okay, the cultural big bang that the Gutenberg printing press started. The Reformation, Martin Luther, the 95 Theses. According to James Burke in his documentary, The Day the Universe Changed, Martin Luther, the legend would have it that he tacked 95 theses, 95 arguing, arguing points that he wanted to talk about. And Luther, Burke said, this is not, this act, if he did actually do it, did he, it did actually nail the 95 theses, which was an agenda for discussion. If he actually did it, this was not necessarily a sign of disrespect. This was normal. Hey, let's talk about bulletin board. Right. Right. Typically. And so this was normal. Well, what according to Burke, 
Luther made the mistake of giving a copy to uh, one of some of his friends, right? They set this puppy in type <laughs> and printed it, okay, and spread it out in German. All right, and these people took, did the same. They reset it in type when they got the circle. This was a guy on a horseback, panning out these pamphlets, raising a ruckus, okay? And they would reset it in, in type again and make their copies. According to Burke, within a week, it was all over Germany. Within a month, it was all over Europe. Now, the Russians had the same thing during the period of the USSR, except it was the mimeograph machine, not the printing press. Uh. So the first Samistat was not Russian, it was German. And then the Reformation started, the printing press and alphabet gave rise to Protestantism, Martin Luther, and the world was never the same after that. <laughs> Anything else I need? Let's thank our speaker again for a wonderful, yeah. wonderful presentation. Thank you. And the turn us out, Brom. Is it typical to have the people? Thank you all for coming. I want to all safely come back when you can. Okay, on the subject of three different people.